Did you know that Jehovah is such a great host that he has prepared a spiritual table for us? A table that has so many well-oiled dishes. It's just a spiritual banquet. And the fact that Jehovah has a table tells us that he is hosting us. He's such a great host that he invites us at his table. Now turn with me in your Bible to the 23rd Psalm. And here's what the psalmist has to say about Jehovah's table. Here in the 23rd Psalm, at verse 5, the psalmist says, speaking of Jehovah, You arrange before me a table in front of those showing hostility to me. With oil you've greased my head and my cup is well filled. He's referring to Jehovah. He said that Jehovah has made an arrangement that he's arranged a table. And anytime you're hosting someone, there's a lot of work, there's preparation involved. But Jehovah is the great host. The psalmist said he's arranged a table in front of him. And it's at a time when people are hostile toward him sitting at Jehovah's table. He said he arranged the table in front of all those showing hostility. Look at verse 5, the latter part. He said, with oil you've greased my head and my cup is well filled. But during Bible times, if you traveled, you didn't have a plane or a train, a car or a motorcycle or anything like that. The majority of the times when you traveled, you had to walk. If at best you were rich, you had people that would carry you on their shoulders, or you might have a beast of burden. But the majority of the people, they just walked. That meant by the time they got to their destination, they were sandy, dusty, dirty, and probably well scraped up. So what the host would do, they would have oil when you got to their home. You know, when people get ashy, what do they do? They, they need lotion. They need Vaseline and oil and so forth. So they would have oil for you. And they'd kind of rub you down and grease you down. And actually it would be likened to a massage. In the Bible, oil, it means exaltation, it means joy, and it would be very soothing for a person to get there after battling all the elements. And before they even ate a meal, you rub them down with oil. Now imagine being invited over someone's home, and before you even eat, they just kind of give you a massage, a little rub down. And in today's pressures, you say, well, get this side here, brother. And, and then he, they, they kind of rub you down. Well, that's what the psalmist says of Jehovah. He said, with oil you've greased my head. And he said, my cup is well filled. Now, not only has Jehovah made arrangements, but the psalmist said, I have everything I need at your table. There's no need of me going anywhere else. In fact, when I'm at your table, I don't have to go rummaging around in the camps of the wicked one, trying to find sustenance and covering. I have everything I need if I can just stay at your table. That's what the psalmist said about Jehovah. Look at our next verse, the 23rd Psalm in verse 6. He said, Surely, goodness and loving kindness themselves will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Jehovah to the length of days. The psalmist says, Now once I get at God's table, he said, I'll never leave. If I can just get at Jehovah's table, he said, I'll dwell there to the length of days. You couldn't bow me away from Jehovah's table. He said, I can get there. I'll never leave Jehovah's table. And look what happens when you're at Jehovah's table. There at the 23rd Psalm in verse 6. He says, surely goodness and loving kindness themselves will pursue me all the days of my life. So as long as we're at Jehovah's table, what's going to pursue us? You notice what the Bible says will pursue us? If we can just stay at Jehovah's table. What's going to pursue you at Jehovah's table? He said, goodness and loving kindness. That's what's going to pursue us. Have you ever been pursued by something? Now, not someone, but something. <laughs> you ever been pursued by something? How would you feel if you were being pursued by a pit bull terrier? How would you feel? You know, due to its strength, ferociousness, and its tenacity, uh, that dog is banned in some countries. You can't even bring it in the country. How would you feel if you were being pursued by a pit bull? Well, the psalmist said that's, that's not what pursues us at Jehovah's table. How would you feel if you were being pursued by a snake? You know, some can't even see a snake on TV. They start jumping. Woo! Woo! Yeah. But now, wait a minute. How would you feel if you were being pursued by a snake. Now, due to the way snakes are made, they're attracted to warm-blooded animals. That's you and I. 
A snake can detect heat the way our hearing can detect sound. When we hear sound, we automatically know it probably came from somewhere over there. That's where a snake can detect heat. Like if you're in a desert trying to lay down and take a nap, you better build a fire around you or something because a snake will automatically start moving towards you. It'll know that you're there. Well, how would you feel if you were being pursued by a snake? But that's, that's not what pursues you at Jehovah's table. The psalmist said, goodness and loving kindness will pursue us all the days if we just stay at Jehovah's table. That reminds me of a story one of the district overseers tell. Uh, here in the United States, he's one of the few black district overseers that we have. But uh, years ago, when our work was uh, separated, now the world, it was segregated, but with our brothers, we just say they were separated. But, you know, years ago, uh, the brothers and sisters, especially in the South, they were separated. So you had a black traveling overseer. He would serve the black congregations. And you had a white traveling overseer. Why, he would serve, he would serve the white congregations. Well, this brother, he's in the circuit work, and they're in the deep South. The state will, the name of the state will be withheld to protect the innocent and the guilty. <laughs> but he was in the deep South. And they're on their way to their new assignment to serve the congregation. And they had a visitor that had come to visit them. So she said, I'm going to go with you to your new congregation. Well, they're in the deep south and they're traveling on their way going to their new congregation. And as they pass by one little street, out pulls a pickup truck and it starts to follow them. Now, he said it was one of those pickup trucks where you could see the rifle in the window. You ever seen one of those? And everywhere they would go, this truck would go. He would turn right and the truck would turn right. The truck was actually pursuing them. He, he sped up a little bit and the truck sped up. Now, here they are in the deep south. Now, after a while, he kind of notices it. And his wife notices it and the visitor too. So there's agitation in the car. He said, but don't worry about it because we have the map to get to the home where we're going. And uh, what I'll do, and I'm going to get off this main street and make a right and I can go down and make a left and another left. I go up over the ravine and I can get right back on this main street and then we'll just kind of be on our way because the truck's not going to do all of that. Well, every turn he made, the truck made the turn. He went up over the ravine and the truck went up over the ravine. He got right back on the main street, the truck sped up and just followed him. Well, he says, let me pull, the, pull over and let's, let's get this over with. He said, I'm going to kind of go back here and just see what this is all about. He said, Mac, now we already had three strikes against us. He said, number one, we were Jehovah's Witnesses. He said, number two, we're black and we're in the deep south. He said, number three, we were in a Volkswagen. You ever try to outrun somebody in a Volkswagen? <laughs> so he says, I'm just going to pull over and just, let's just go back here and see if I can get this over with. He said, before he could get out of the car, he's explaining to his wife, he's telling his wife, he said, now, now don't leave me. That's what he told his wife and his sister. Don't leave me. I'm just going to go back and just see what this is all about. Before he can get out of the car, he said, here's a big, burly white man standing right next to him. And he's knocking on the window. He said, Mac, it was one of those hard knocks, too. Roll the window down. That's what the man said. He said, by now his heart's beating. Got no moisture in his mouth. And he said with the deepest, most manly voice he could, he said, yes, can we help you? <laughs> he said the man knocked on the window again. Rolled the window down. And as he's sitting there contemplating what he's going to do, he's getting ready to kind of crack the window. And as he cracks the window, the man says, are you Jehovah's Witnesses? He said, now, Mac, that was already one of the strikes against us. Well, he told the man, uh, why, yes, we are. The man said, I thought so. He said, my mother's one of you people. She's a witness, and she told me the black traveling overseer was coming in town. He said, I got all kind of food and blankets and non-perishables back here. I've been following you to try to give it to you. He said, you made quite a few turns there, didn't you, buddy? You know what the brother said? He said, Mac, we couldn't run from a blessing. He said, we learned we couldn't run from a blessing. He said, but loving kindness and goodness, it was pursuing us. He said, it will pursue us all the days of our life 
if we can just stay at Jehovah's table. But guess what happened? Here Jehovah is the great host. We have everything we need at his table. No need in going and rummaging around in the camps of the wicked one to find sustenance because we have all we need at his table. The psalmist said, with oil you've greased my head and my cup is well filled. But guess what happened? The nation of Israel left Jehovah's table. Can you believe that? The nation of Israel, they left Jehovah's table. Now turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 2, Jehovah told the heavens. He told those in heavens, you won't believe it, but they left my table. It's hard for us to believe. It's hard for us to imagine. But in Jeremiah chapter 2, here in Jeremiah chapter 2, let's look together. At verse 12. Now Jehovah is saying you won't believe it heavens. But here's what happened. Stare in amazement O you heavens at this. And bristle up in great horror is the utterance of Jehovah. Because there are two bad things my people have done. They left even me the source of living water. In order to hew out for themselves cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot contain the water. Jehovah says can you believe it. He said, my people have left me the source of living water. And why did they leave Jehovah? Did you notice what they left him for? They didn't even leave him for a well. A well is a source of water. Jehovah said, my people left me for a cistern. Now a cistern is just a little runoff of rock. It's a little cavity of rock that whenever it rains, it'll catch a little rain water right there in that situation. Jehovah said, they didn't leave me for a well. They left me for a cistern, and a broken cistern at that. Couldn't even contain the water. He says, oh, you won't believe what you're seeing. He said, stare in amazement, O heavens, and bristle up in great horror. Now, there's another story that a member of the governing body, he told all of us brothers when we first went to Bethel, as young brothers. He says, now, you won't believe it, but here's what happened. Would you believe a brother left Bethel because he didn't want to get his hair cut? Now at Bethel we get our hair cut every three weeks. That's law. You're going to get your hair cut if you're going to be at Bethel every three weeks. Either the Bethel barber is going to cut it. Somebody's going to have to cut your hair every three weeks. That's law. Well this brother he didn't want to get his hair cut. Didn't want to get his hair cut. You know the brothers talk with him and counsel him and encourage him and try to reason with him. They can pull out some scriptures on you there at Bethel. Oh they pull out scriptures you've never seen before. So they're just pulling out scriptures and trying to reason with him on getting his hair cut. You know, he refused to cut his hair. You know, the brothers let him know, well, if, you know, if you're not going to conform and get your hair cut, you're probably going to have to leave. You know, he left Bethel. Yes, yeah, stare in amazement, O oh heavens, and bristle up in great horror. He left Bethel because he didn't want to get his hair cut. Well, he left Bethel and went back home. Not a knock against anyone from Florida, but he was from Florida. He went back home, got a job, got a job at Disney World. Now at that time, Disney World, they ran a tight ship. You know, they told him, now we'd like to hire you, but you're going to have to get your hair cut. <laughs> you know, he cut his hair. Oh, stare in amazement, oh heavens, and bristle up in great horror. He cut his hair so that he can get a job at Disney World. He was there at the house of God. Brother Barber said he wouldn't cut his hair for the, uh, for the Messianic kingdom. He cut it for the Magic Kingdom. But the barber said he wouldn't cut his hair for Christ's brothers. He cut it for Mickey Mouse and wouldn't get his hair cut there at Bethel. He left Jehovah's table because he didn't want to get his hair cut. Can you believe that? Well, see, the nation of Israel, they left Jehovah's table. They put their trust and their confidence in other nations that were like a broken cistern. They didn't put trust and confidence in Jehovah. Look at what Jehovah asked them in verse 18, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 18. Jehovah asked them, and now what concern should you have for the way of Egypt in order to drink the waters of Shihar? And what concern should you have for the way of Assyria in order to drink the waters 
of the river. Egypt pictures the world. And Jehovah's asking us, if you are at my table, what concern should you have for the world? Why are you going to put your faith and your confidence in the world? If you could read some of the letters that come in, they'd scare you to death. You know, some of the letters that come in, the brothers will say, you know, I can't believe all this. I can't believe all this, the slave is saying. That I'm sending my kids to college. They say, I can't believe all this. It's hard to make it in this world without a college degree. They say, when we came out of school, you told us to pioneer until Armageddon. One brother said, and that's what we did. We came out of school and we pioneered. He said, now I'm barely making it. Barely have a retirement. He said, I can't believe all this. And Jehovah said, now what concern should you have for Egypt? To drink the waters of the river. You know, some are tempted to leave Jehovah's table. You know, some are tempted to put more faith and more confidence in a cistern and a broken cistern at that, that can't contain the water than they are in Jehovah. If you only knew how the members of the governing body felt about you, if you only knew. It's hard for you to sit there and imagine how they feel about you. But we hear it in their prayers. If you only knew the loving kindness that's being displayed to us by Jehovah God and the faithful slave, why, you'd, you'd sit up like giants. Those brothers are praying long and they're praying hard about you. We hear their prayers. They know you're out here on the front line. They know what you're going through. It's not just a group of men that's in a building printing literature and that's all that's involved. It's not that way. The brothers feel directly responsible for each and every member of the great crowd. Do you know that Christ's brothers, the governing body, the faithful slave, do you know that they feel directly responsible for you? Why, if something happens to you, they feel maybe they did something wrong. Maybe they've been insubordinate to Christ. That's why the watchtower, can, can it get any plainer, the way they're trying to explain it? They feel responsible for you. They love you. They're concerned. And they want you to know that loving kindness and goodness will pursue you all the days at Jehovah's table. I know I was a new elder and getting ready to go on a shepherding call. And... Uh, it was a Friday, and the shepherding call was Friday night, and I did research the packet. It was about, it was about an inch thick. I was ready. And early in the mornings, one of the members of the governing body, he would always be down early, about 6.30. Morning worship didn't start until 7. I went down one morning, and I saw him over there. It was Brother Siddick, the brother with the deep voice. And I saw him over there. We would talk from time to time, and I went, and I said, Brother Siddick, go on, on a shepherding call tonight. He said, that's good, Mac. That's good. The brothers need shepherding. <laughs> and I showed him my research. I said, here's what I have. And I knew he couldn't possibly have anything to add to it. I said, here's what, here's what we're going to share with him. I explained the situation. And he took it and he looked at it. He just kind of looked at the top page. He looked up at me. He looked back down at it. Kind of read over it a little bit. He looked up at me. He said, Mac, you don't get it, do you? I was offended. I said, what is this brother talking about? I don't get it. Did all this research. I did half the research in the publication he probably wrote. He's talking about I don't get it. He said, now, now Mac, according to what you just explained to me, you're going to share this with him? He said, you don't get it, do you? You plan to share this with him? By now, I'm backing up. I was just kind of like, well, I... Thought I was. <laughs> he said, Mac, the way women show up to work nowadays is sexual harassment. The way they show up to work nowadays. They don't have to say anything to the brother. It's just the way they show up. And you're going to share this with him? He said, you don't get it. That's what he told me. He said, the brothers don't need this. This what you have? He said, they don't need this. And then I caught on. I said, oh boy. I began to realize the way they felt. He said, the brothers need to know that you feel. They need to know that you love them. 
They don't need to know how much you know. They want to know how much you care. I took what I had and I threw it in the garbage. Now here's the funny thing, as I was leaving the dining room that morning, he called to me, he said, Mac, you barely in the truth. He told me I was barely in the truth. I could barely make it to work that day. I was shattered. I was stumbling. I wanted someone to come study with me. He told me I was barely in the truth. But I caught on. I caught on. I began to realize that it's Jehovah's loving kindness. It's Jehovah's loving kindness. If you only knew how the brothers felt about you. If you only knew. Now from time to time there at Bethel they give us talks and discussion. It's designed to help us in our spirituality. And one talk, Brother Silic, he gave a talk. Let me tell you how he started. He said, I tell you now, we're going to talk about something you know very little about. If you will ever understand it. That's where he started his talk. He says, you know very little bit about it if you will ever understand it. He said, we're going to talk about Jehovah's loving kindness. He said, David is the new king. He said, there's a new king in Israel, and it's King David. That's the way he started his talk. He said, now usually whenever there was a new king, it would be joyful times for the family of the new king, but horrible times for the family of the old king. So usually all of the boys in the family of the old king, they'd be killed, they'd be destroyed, they'd be wiped out for fear they would come back for revenge or reprisal. He said, but it's a new king in Israel. And David did something that was shocking. No other king had ever done this before. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, look at verse 1. This is what David said, and he's picturing Jehovah. And David proceeded to say, Is there yet anyone that is left over of the house of Saul, that I may exercise loving kindness toward him for the sake of Jonathan? Saul was the old king. Now David does something that no one else had ever done. It's unprecedented. He said, is there anybody left that I can exercise loving kindness to him? He's looking for someone of that household to show loving kindness to. Well, look at the next verse. Now the house of Saul had a servant whose name was Ziba. That's significant. The house of Saul had a servant whose name was Ziba. So they called him to David. And the king then said to him, Are you Ziba? To which he said, I am your servant. Now what Ziba is telling him? He says, I'm your man. I'm your servant. I've served in the house of Saul. I know what goes on in these households of royalty. I know what takes place here. I know who belongs here. He says, I'm your man. You're the new king. But I know how to run a household of a king. And so look at what David went on to say. Verse 3. And the king went on to say, Is there nobody of the house of Saul anymore that I may exercise toward him the loving kindness of God? You see, it's Jehovah's loving kindness. Now note the response. At this, Ziba said to the king, There is yet a son of Jonathan lame in the feet. Then the king said to him, where is he? So Ziba said to him, look, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amuel at Lodabar. Brother Sidlick said, Lodabar, Lodabar. He told us that was the ghetto. 
He said it was across the tracks. No one but cripples and undesirables lived in Lodabar. No one else wanted to live there. Ziba is saying, now hold on king, don't go too far. He says, I know what belongs in this household of royalty. The only one who's left of Jonathan is his son. He's a cripple. He doesn't belong here. In fact, he lives in Lodabar. David said, that's the man that I'm looking for. You go and get him and you bring him to this house. That's who I'm looking for to show loving kindness to. It's the loving kindness of God. Mephibosheth was crippled because when the news came about his father and grandfather being killed, the nurse that was carrying him, she was running in a hurry, probably thinking for the fear of his life, she accidentally dropped him, and from there he was lame in both of his feet. And he's over there in Lodabar. And now the king is telling Ziba, you go and get him, because that's the man that I'm looking for. Now what Brother Silic did next, for those of us that had survived the talk up until now, <laughs> what he did next, we, we all, we just, we, we, we fell out of our seat. He picked up a bell and he started ringing it. He said, dinner time in David's house. At dinner time in the king's house, who would you expect to be sitting at the king's table? Who dines at the table of a king? It would be David and all of his children. Now beauty ran in David's family. Everybody remember that? It didn't do him much good, but beauty ran in the family. <laughs> oh, they were beautiful people. The Bible describes David as a ruddy man. That means you, you couldn't even put a, a finger on his complexion. He was just a beautiful man. And you remember David's son? His son, tall man, jet black hair. Absalom. Anybody remember Absalom? The sister said, mm-hmm. <laughs> Absalom was so good looking that they cut his hair only once a year. When they cut his hair once a year, his hair alone weighed five pounds. You hear the sister? <laughs> yeah. His hair alone weighed five pounds. Now here's what the Bible says of Absalom. It said there was no man so beautiful as Absalom. From the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, there was no man in all Israel that proved to be so beautiful. What a man. And there's Absalom. He's sitting at the king's table because it's dinner time at David's house. And Absalom is sitting there. Well, who else would you expect to be there at the king's table? Who else would you expect to be there? You remember Absalom's sister Tamar? Oh, what a beautiful woman. Now, Brother Silic, he described Tamar. We were looking for Tamar that night. <laughs> oh, we love our wives. Oh, we love our wives. But well, we were looking for Tamar that night. Now he helped us to appreciate that the king's daughter, she would have access to beauty treatments to her that no other person would have. He said she probably smelled like the flowers of Lebanon, bathed with the oils of Bashan. All we wanted to see Tamar. He just explained Tamar. She was so beautiful, remember, her half-brother raped her. She was so gorgeous, her own brother raped her. She was just that good looking. You see, it's dinner time at David's house and beautiful Tamar would be sitting there. Well, who else would you expect to be at the king's table? He said, there's Solomon probably sitting at the end of the table with his head buried in a book. And there's studious Solomon right there. Remember David's two nephews? Abishai and then Joab. Mighty warriors. Courageous men. Now by now he's strutting to and from the platform. He's demonstrating Joab walking in. He said, and in walks Joab, sun-baked, skin like tan leather, beady eyes of a killer. He's just showing us how he's walking in. And he said, Joab walks in and he was cut. <laughs> so in walks Joab. And he finds his seat at David's table along with his relative Abishai. And all of a sudden you hear skark clink, skark clink, skark clink, skark clink. In walks a cripple. With all of this beauty at the table, in walks a cripple. 
Brother Siddick said his kids probably said, Dad, can he take his food to go, please? <laughs> and that's when he lowered the boom on us. Anyone that survived the talk up till now, or we heard a talk that night. Anyone who was at Bethel will never forget that talk. Because it demonstrated Jehovah's loving kindness. And that's when he told us. He said, we're all crippled brothers. Adam and Eve dropped every one of us. We're all crippled. We're all messed up. Just look at ourselves. We're all messed up. You know, and if you don't think you're messed up, that's what's wrong with you. You don't know you're messed up. <laughs> you're just as messed up as all the rest of us. We're all crippled. We have frailties and infirmities. We don't want anyone to know. And the problem is, we make it hard on each other to stay at the table. Because David's kids, they look up and say, well, where is he going? He, he's not supposed to be at our table. Well, where is he going? And we're hard on each other. We make it hard to sit at that table. We look at each other and say, I know he's not coming to the table. We look at her and say, she need to quit. We look at the brother and say, he's not going to make it. You see, we're hard on each other at that table. And you live in Lodabar. No matter what you pay for your mortgage, you're in the ghetto. <laughs> Don't think for one minute you're not in the ghetto. Oh, you live in the ghetto. We're at the end of a dying in a wicked system. It's nasty and filthy outside. They may have you pay more and fool you in your mind, but not in God's sight. We live in a filthy world. It's beneath Jehovah. It's across the tracks. It's in the ghetto. That's where we live. Now Mephibosheth, he couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand how the king wanted him to sit at his table. And isn't that the way we are? We can't appreciate Jehovah's loving kindness. We can't understand it. There's things about us we don't want anyone to know. We compromise. We capitulated. We went back at times. And we don't want anybody to know that. We don't understand Jehovah's loving kindness. And we tell people, there's things about me... Uh, you, you just don't know. And when they give us commendation, we say, well, if you really knew how I was, you wouldn't say that. So now I feel worse. You know, there are some people that serve God. They pray that they can just die. They say, Jehovah, just let me die. You won't even let me die even. We feel we're not worthy. To be at Jehovah's table. We can't understand his loving kindness. Mephibosheth, he couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand what he was doing at David's table. And many times he'd look up and see Absalom and say, Oh, what a handsome man. I got no business at this. Let me leave. And David would say, Stay at the table. He'd look at beautiful Tamar and say, Oh, what a woman. Ooh, I have no business at this table with Tamar. I can't measure up. He said, Please, can't. Uh, can I be excused? And David said, stay at the table. He looked at Solomon. How could he match wits with Solomon? He looked at mighty Joab and said, oh, the courageous man. One of his looks will kill me, so I'm not going to look at him. <laughs> he's, trying to, he's trying to stay at the table. Can I be excused, please? And David said, stay at the table. Now, in Israel, one of the worst things would be a dog. See, a, a dog in Israel was a dog. It's not the way we treat dogs here in the Western world. We hear dogs have houses and sweaters, <laughs> give them facelifts and operations and things. No, in Israel, you were, a dog was a dog. That's why uh, the most terrible thing is for you to be killed and then to have the dogs lick you up. Mephibosheth could not understand Jehovah's loving kindness. He couldn't understand it. Look at what he said in 2 Samuel. Uh, let's turn back just to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Look at verse 8. Look at what Mephibosheth says. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 8. At that he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you have turned your face to the dead dog such as I am? He said, I'm not even a dog, I'm a dead dog. Why are you showing loving kindness to me? 
Do you ever feel that way? You see, if you only knew the love that Jehovah has for us, if you could only understand the work and the effort and the appreciation that the faithful slave has for you, if you could only appreciate, it's not just a group of men printing literature in a building. They recognize the loving kindness of God. Sure, you've done wrong and you've been disciplined. You've had hard times. You've had trouble. Regardless of what you've done. Regardless of the way you feel. Stay at Jehovah's table. Jehovah's not limited. He's not like humans. As humans, we remember things and we'll never let you live it down. That's the way we are as humans. We'll sit back and say, I remember what he did back in 1982. We look at the sister in person and say, you know, she's so encouraging. And you say, well, she's all right. I know her back in the day, girl. <laughs> Jehovah's not that way. Manasseh did on a large scale what was bad in Jehovah's eye. The Bible says on a grand scale he sinned against Jehovah. Jehovah not only restored him, he forgave him and made him king again. That's the God we serve. Jehovah says, don't be mindful of what these humans keep against you. Jehovah says, I'm not that way. A struggling person is not a bad person. We're just struggling, that's all. You're not bad. Just remain faithful and stay at Jehovah's table. You know, 40,000 people a year worldwide, they become inactive. They leave Jehovah's table. Are we making it hard for them to stay at God's table? Many, they come and they try when the mercy of God is pointed out at the memorial. Millions come and associate with it at the, at the memorial, but they can't come back. They don't stay at God's table. Do we make it difficult for them to stay at God's table? Are we making them feel like a dead dog? You see, we're all crippled brothers. Adam and Eve dropped every one of us. Let's make it comforting and encouraging to stay at Jehovah's table. Regardless of what you've done. Regardless of how you feel. Never think that Jehovah will not forgive you because he's looking for people like us to show loving kindness to. Now the thing about this table, uh, the table, they didn't sit upright the way we're sitting now in this western world. They would usually recline maybe on the hip, on the shoulder, on the elbow. That's the way they would recline at the table. And these tables, they were a little lower and they had these long skirts, beautiful embroidered skirts like tablecloths. Oh, you couldn't match them in these households of royalty. Beautiful long tablecloth. Now the skirt would cover the length of the table and it would come over, it would cover everybody's legs. So when Mephibosheth as a cripple, when he sat at the table, he was just like everybody else. All his frailties and infirmities, they were covered as long as he stayed at Jehovah's table. And Brother Siddick helped us to appreciate that that skirt pictured the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jehovah is telling us that you're covered at this table. I got you covered at this table. Don't leave. Just stay at the table. You have all the covering. You have everything you need. I don't even see your frailties. I've been looking for people like you to show loving kindness to. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's look at this verse. Very encouraging. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Look at verse 11. So Ziba said to the king, In accord with all that my lord the king commands for his servant is the way that your servant will do. But Mephibosheth is eating at my table like one of the sons of the king. He was there. He was right there at David's table. It was Jehovah's loving kindness. And verse 13. And Mephibosheth himself was dwelling in Jerusalem. For it was constantly at the table of the king that he was eating. And he was lame in both of his feet. Mephibosheth stayed at that table. He stayed at God's table. 
Ziba said, okay, Jehovah, it's just like you saying it. He's like one of the sons of the king. He'll stay at your table. Mephibosheth said, sure, I've had hard times. And I'm a cripple. And I don't even understand this loving kindness. He said, but I'll never leave this table. And the Bible says it was at Jehovah's table he stayed. Although he was lame in both of his feet. You see, the skirt had covered all of his sins, all of his frailties, all of his foibles, all of his problems. The skirt had covered his legs. Lovers of God and those who fear God. Whatever you do, don't leave. We're almost home. We're almost home. Jehovah says, you're covered at this table. I love you. Don't ever doubt it. You know what Jehovah tells us? He says, why do you end a sentence with a question mark when I've ended it with a period? He's telling us that his son died for us. And he's been looking for people like us to show loving kindness to. Always stay at Jehovah's table.